Without further ado, here's Jeremy Barmet. Susan, thank you so much for well generously inviting me to come over, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. I hope my delivery is not too mumbly. I have a, an Antipodean accent, and I'll try and enunciate clearly. Um, Americans are famous for enunciating very clearly with sort of cement drilling vowels, and I try and <laughs> I'll try and emulate it, but you might find it a bit mumbly. As my father has always complained about my language. Um, let me just. Is it moving? Oh, no. That's right. So the, this is the title of my talk, and I'll, I'll explain what the, the silence reigns and the starting clap of thunder in, the, in but a moment. But we'll start with this rather garish um, poster. 1st of October this year, last year, the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Now, it's actually been a practice for some 15 years now in the People's Republic to proclaim major state events as reflecting what, in the traditional language of China, is called the prosperous age or the new prosperous age. In Chinese, it's called sheng shi. It literally is, it means a golden age. The expression was in, became so common, in fact, during the 1910s, uh, 2010s, that I invited a group of colleagues from UC Berkeley, Harvard, UBC in Vancouver and Monash University in Melbourne, as well as the Free University in Berlin, to join me in producing an issue of my then journal, China Heritage Quarterly, devoted to the topic of China's new sheng shi, or golden age. That journal appeared in June 2011, it can still be seen online. Chinese rulers marked golden or prosperous ages, sheng shi, for nearly 2,000 years. But in the annals of Chinese autocracy, they're as rare as hen's teeth. Now, on the eve of the Communist Party's fourth plenum of its 19th Party Congress, a fortnight, about a month ago now, six weeks ago now, the state media of China declared that the nation was edging even closer to something new. It declared, declared that China was approaching what, it, what is called the new age of Chinese rule or governance, Zhongguo Zhizhi. Now, Zhongguo Zhizhi is also a kind of sheng shi, a prosperous age. What's particularly interesting about this is that Zhizhi, a term using Zhizhi, the rule of or the rule, the stable rule or good governance of a certain era, has only been declared a number of times in the last 2,800 years of Chinese history. So November 2019 is important because it marked the first time in a very long time that the Chinese, a ruling group in charge of the territory that we call China declared itself to be in this particular stage of prosperity and strength. I still recommend that work that we collectively did a decade ago about the prosperous age. You'll see the background to all of these ideas. Long predated Xi Jinping's rise to power, but he and his colleagues have brought it into a new focus. Similar ages of unique kinds of stable, strong rule in the Chinese world have been declared only a number of times. There is, for example, the Kang Cheng rule of the Zhou period. The, it's called Cheng Kang Zhi Zhi from about the 8th century BC. That's Zhizhi number one. There has been the Wenjing Zhizhi, the Wenjing rule of the Han Dynasty, about 2,000 years ago. There is the Zhengguan Zhizhi of the Tang Dynasty. That's the first one I ever heard of in, when I was a student in the 1970s. And then there's the famous Kangxi Qianlong Sheng Shi, the prosperous age of the Kangxi and Qianlong reigns of the 18th century, well, in fact, 6th, 17th, and 18th centuries. As I said, these prosperous ages, these ages declared in Chinese historical annals, have only occurred a number of times. Zhongguo Zhizhi is the first time it's been declared since the 18th century. Um, we should also here at this point recall that from the time of the Sino-Soviet contestation of the 1950s when the People's Republic was very much part of the Soviet 
socialist camp um, in global history, the People's Republic has framed itself repeatedly, if not always consistently, as being a unique experiment, as an avant-garde for humanity as a whole, as both uniquely Chinese, but one with a universal significance. So these claims of universality and global significance are not necessarily all that new, but they have taken on a particular edge and significance given China's extraordinary um, political and economic heft in the 21st century. Now, people may well scoff at all of this and discard that Maoist era and earlier eras of Chinese universal claims, and I myself am by nature a skeptic, but it is important to understand the underpinnings of this type of Chinese hubris that Xi Jinping and his colleagues are now giving voice to. And indeed the appeal, not only in China but globally, of autocratic, not merely Chinese, um, rule in, in today's global context. Sadly, it's something you're all familiar with in America given your own um, autocrat, would-be autocrat in Washington. So it's a perfect time for the approach to the study of the Chinese world that I've advocated for many years of new Sinology. That is a Sinology, a study of the Chinese world that's engaged with tradition, aware of the modern, aware of the Maoist, Marxist, Leninist lineages within the Chinese government, aware too of the neoliberal economic policies and settings of Chinese governmental behavior, and aware too of these um, ineffable elements of Chinese culture and thought that constantly inform and modulate contemporary realities. Um, it is also wrong headed, headed to think that this type of quasi-imperial hubris, the talking of Zhong Guo Zhizhi, the unique Chinese form of rule that the Chinese Communist Party is beginning to say is not only uniquely suited to China, but also may have a universal valence globally it's not just um, wrong-headed to think of this hu hubris as merely being the work of Xi Jinping, a, a neo-autocrat, or one individual, or merely his advisors. After all, I think that many of these elements of um, culture of thought have been around in the Chinese world for a long time. Of course, Sheng Shi, in an earlier phase under Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, prefers itself as this, somewhat a bit, a bit more louche and a bit more colorful. So one shouldn't forget there's this also underbelly of the prosperous golden age of decadence and self-indulgence that despite Xi Jinping's clean living anti-corruption campaign continues to bubble away quite happily in China. But I today will mostly concentrate on the more elite aspects of Chinese life and not talk too much about what I call, think of as the other China. That's that wonderful, lively, rambunctious um, world of China and of Hong Kong and of Taiwan, these complex, interesting, globally engaged places that we're all also familiar with. So I'm not concentrating on that today and I'm not denying their incredible importance. But this is the image we saw on the 1st of October last year, the 70th anniversary. Um, on the day that this major celebration and huge national parade took place in Beijing, the same time the leading Chinese Communist Party theoretical journal called Chu Shu Magazine, inappositely named, it means seeking facts or seeking the truth, uh, perhaps best translated as fake news, but nonetheless, it is a, a leading theoretical journal, and it published an extraordinary article. Its lead article was a long piece by Xi Jinping himself. It was a collection of comments and ideas that Xi Jinping had articulated over the last number of years that relate directly to the issue of imperial rule and Chinese history. Was, as I said, published on October the 1st, a major and significant day, and it dealt with, among other things, it dealt with this man. It dealt with Qin Shi Huang, literally first emperor Shi Huang of the Qin dynasty, China's first imperial dynasty and its first imperial ruler. And Xi Jinping f focused in his article at first on Qin Shi Huang. Qin Shi Huang is known as the man who brought to realization something that had been debated in the Chinese intellectual world from the 8th century to about the 3rd century BC, and that re related to the concept of Di Ye, the imperial enterprise. That thing that reflected a political ruler who was not merely 
a marshal, a general, somebody who controlled the territory of a certain part of this, what was called the Central Plains, we call basically China, but also somebody who had this near spiritual aspect to their rulership, that they were not merely immortal, that they had been given the right to rule by the numinous forces of heaven and earth itself, known as, they were, became known as Tianzi, uh, sons of heaven. Qin Shi Huang was the first imperial ruler who had not only this earthly rule and right to rule and power and military power, but also this numinous spiritual dimension to his rule and also presumably the role of moral arbiter and, and, and strict ruler and controller. <clears throat> Although the first emperor only ruled for 11 years, one short of the 12 years of the German Third Reich, I'd point out, the imperial ambition and harsh rule of the Qin, it's called Qin Zhi in Chinese, has haunted Chinese politics for 2,200 years. In official China, that is the China we encounter when reading the People's Daily, listening to the Xinhua, uh, Xinhua um, broadcast or uh, central television, and when we speak to our Chinese official interlocutors in their official role, not their private roles, but the, that's the official China, when we deal with that world, this is the version of China promoted by the Chinese Communist Party. Qin Shi Huang and his rule are praised for having created a unified empire with a standard writing system, standard communications, trade, stability, and a proper controlled version of legal, if harsh, rule over society. For unofficial China, that is everybody else, and also most official China when speaking privately, there's that world, the China is, China is a world that is complex, one of independent thought and culture. It's this bustling, complex world I call the Chinese Commonwealth. Today, the Qin, and as it did for over two millennia, presents a unity forged by draconian laws, inhuman punishments, and the crushing of intellectual and cultural diversity. We internationally know it most popularly in the version of the delightfully... Um, uh, unearthed terracotta warriors of the Qin tomb. Nonetheless, the Qin dynasty has enjoyed a special place both in official China and in the popular imagination for over 45 years in the People's Republic. That's in part because of this. In March 1974, farmers in the outskirts of the city of Xi'an in Shanxi province discovered a group of buried funerary statues. They're known as the Qin terracotta army. The figures were of scholars arranged in serried ranks inside a necropolis surrounding the tomb of the first Qin emperor, Qin Shi Huang, the man that Xi Jinping was talking about in his October the 1st essay last year. That archaeological find was both ironically timely. Mao Zedong, who was the founding ruler of the Chinese People's Republic, had himself frequently referred to himself and his style of government as being like that of the Qin emperor. In fact, as I was saying to Susan a number of times, Mao referred to himself as being, well, me, I am Qin Shi Huang plus Marx. Wo shi Qin Shi Huang jia Ma Ke Si. The famous Maoist quote, Mao quote. The Qin Emperor, Qin Emperor is particularly famous among every people in China um, and has been for many centuries for, fame, for having quashed intellectual diversity of his day and for, and the term is commonly used in Chinese, for burning the books and burying the scholars. Fen Shu Keng Gu. So censorship in China is often just referred to as Fen Shu Keng Gu. He rid himself not only of troublesome texts, he also deleted the authors and their readers. Now, in modern China, Chairman Mao liked the idea of burying scholars and burning books. In fact, during uh, the aftermath of the Hundred Flowers movement of 1956 in the wash-up that Deng Xiaoping, when Deng Xiaoping oversaw the crushing of intellectual diversity in China, he was in charge of the anti-rightist movement that saw 500,000 Chinese intellectuals and dissidents and querulous workers sent off to the provinces, demoted, uh, forced into labor camps, and so on and so forth. Um, when all of that happened, Chairman Mao at a secret meeting of the party, well, they were all secret meetings at that time, he commented to his colleagues, including Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping and the amassed members of the Central Committee, he said, what's so impressive about the first emperor? Why does people carry on so much about him? I'm, I'm quoting the great man himself. He only buried 460 scholars alive, while we've buried 46,000. When we suppressed counter-revolutionaries, 
Didn't we also kill some counter-revolutionary intellectuals? I once debated with people in the democratic parties that we allow to exist. You ex accuse us of acting like the first emperor. You're wrong. We've outdone him a hundred times over. You decry us for being dictatorial like Qin Shi Huang. Well, we admit it. What's pathetic is that you people sell us short. We always have to fill in the details for you. The colleagues who heard him make this statement laughed and applauded in delight. Qin Zhu Huang and his haunting necropolis would come to mind again on October the 1st, as I just said, and that's because the great um, new leader, Xi Jinping, referred to him. That day, Xi Jinping, as I said, published this major article in which he mentioned Qin Shi Huang. He also cautioned its, his readers and the people of China about the failings of the Qin Emperor. He said complacency and corruption had led to the downfall of the Qin, that great unifying state. And he said that, um, the, um, and he also, but he nonetheless praised the strength of Qin rule. Xi Jinping's discussion of the Qin Empire on the 1st of October last year and the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic, referred to a debate also that had absorbed thinkers in China for many years. It's a debate that is known simply as the dilemma of China's dynastic cycle. In Chinese it's called Zhou Qi Lun, just the debate about cycles. Um, the Zhou Qi Lun was something that became part of Chinese political discourse and debate in 1945. Sorry, I'm moving back and forth historically. In July 1945, a delegation of independent thinkers and government lobby, sort of independent lobbyists who were very influential in the wartime capital of Chongqing, they were invited to the Yan'an communist base area of Yan'an, uh, by Mao Zedong. This group of intellectuals visited as part of an effort to negotiate a peace between the communists and the nationalist party at the end of the Second World War, the anti-Japanese war, in the hope that a civil war could be avoided. And this group of thinkers included many prominent figures. Mao's hope, and that of Zhou Enlai's, was that this group would go back to Chongqing and encourage Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government to negotiate in good faith with the communists to avoid a civil war. Now, during this visit, these intellectuals saw Yan'an, they saw soldiers training, they saw um, farmers farming, they saw how this um, Yan'an model of productivity, egalitarianism, clean living, and non-corrupt lifestyles reflected the, the socialist egalitarian ethos of the Communist Party. Mao Zedong asked one of them, a very famous educator and uh, progressive political activist by the name of Huang Yanpei, he asked him, so you've seen us, you've seen, you've traveled around Yan'an, you've seen our model farms, our factories, you've seen our workers and our soldiers, what do you think? What do you think will be the future for us and our negotiations with the KMT? And Huang said that he was impressed by what he'd seen. However, he felt this type of clean living, martial environment imposed by the strictures of war and the necessities of China's national crisis could not possibly survive into peacetime. He said, though I admire what you're doing here, nonetheless, I think it's inevitable that rulership in China will always fall back into autocratic ways because this is the weight of our history, it's the weight of hierarchy, it's the weight of habit. These things I fear without a more open modern system <clears throat> will inevitably lead back to autoc autocracy. And he said, so will not our past continue to haunt our future? And this is a modern day sculpture of that famous conversation inaugurated by Xi Jinping a few years ago. And Mao responded, you'd speak of there being an erxing xunhuan, a vicious cycle of autocratic behavior in our country. It's our tradition, it's our history, that is our politics. You regard this as being our fate. I disagree because we, the communists, under me, have found a solution. And we will break free of the cycle of history. Zhou Qilun, your da po Zhou Qilun. It's a very famous exchange. And he said, we've found a way out, and that way is called democracy. As long as the people have oversight over our government, 
then the government will not slacken in its efforts to rule. When everybody takes responsibility, there will be no danger that things will turn, return to how they were. We'll break free of autocracy and we'll become a modern and open society. The exchange between Mao and Huang Yanpei in 1945 was recalled in official propaganda in 1990, just after the student rebellion of 1989 was crushed, because Deng Xiaoping and his fellows said that our democracy, not that student fake democracy supported by the Americans who are trying to overturn our People's Republic, our democracy has broken free of the cycle of autocracy and the past, and we are an endlessly renewing society. And our crushing of this student rebellion is proof that we can maintain stability and continue to move forward. It was recalled again by Xi Jinping in October last year when he said, our democracy, the way we've developed our system, has helped us break free of the autocracy of the past, break free of Qin Shi Huang, break free of the Han, Tang, Sung, Yuan, Ming, Qing, dynastic behaviors. We are unique, we are self-renewing, we are the future of China that will not be burdened by the autocracy of the past. The bold statement, I would say. He said, in fact, a few weeks later, he declared, we have something even better. We have developed, and he called it, Qian Guo Cheng Minzhu, which I translate as the alpha and omega of dem democratic processes. And that means that we have complete oversight over democratic change. Today, Xi Jinping himself, as I've said many times, has more titles and more direct power than even Mao Zedong. He's also allowed himself to be granted the equivalent of lifetime tenure as China's ruler. Xi has repeatedly referred to that exchange between Mao Zedong and Huang Yanpei. He's repeated it many times because he says, we have broken free of the cycle of autocracy in China, just as he himself has asserted his own autocratic rule in China. It's what one would call ironic. Yeah. One of the revolt, and during this, just as there was a revolt against Qin Shi Huang 2,200 odd years ago, there have been constant revolts against autocracy in China ever since. More recently, there's been the revolt against the, well, some people call him the Qin Shi Huang of today, Xi Jinping himself, and it has been um, championed by one, in particular, one lone man, and then now I'll turn to him because he's the person who Susan referred to, whose work I have been translating and introducing to readers globally. This is a man who has pointedly and repeatedly referred to contemporary China under Xi Jinping as being a government run according to the rules and demands of Qin Zhi, Qin-style governance. That is, harsh rule, centralized power, draconian approaches to social issues, and a closed and narrow approach to social change. It's called Qin Zhi in Chinese. This man is a professor in Beijing, and he's a man whose appearance in, 19, in 2018 um, brought to mind the title, of, you know, the title of my talk, which and this is a, a reference to Wu Yu Wu Sheng Chu. This is a, a play that was put on in 1978, just as China's economic reforms were being first mooted, and the change in the post Mao era was taking place. A very famous play was put on in Shanghai and Beijing. It was just called In the Reign of Silence. Despite the silence, we'll speak out. And this play mm -hmm. symbolized part of the move back to a more open and and more uh, contested environment in society. In 78, as I said, audiences in Beijing flocked to a play that really reflected the popular rebellion of 1976 against Mao's own rule, when Mao himself was denounced by people in Tiananmen Square for being like the Qin Emperor. That play was part and parcel of the rehabilitation of Deng Xiaoping and the move of China towards a greater openness and gradually the economic reforms that we've seen over the last 40 years. The play itself was inspired by, if I may, this very famous poem, a poem that has been used and referred to and quoted time and time again since it was first written in 1934. It was written by China's most famous modern writer, Lu Xun, 
And the poem was written basically really about the repressive atmosphere that Lucian and his fellows felt at the time of the Japanese incursion of China during a period of incredible political darkness and oppression. And the poem reads simply, the vast population of our country are adrift in a wilderness. They dare not even sing a dirge to lament the condition that, for fear that the very earth would resound in mourning at their cries. My mind is preoccupied and my thoughts extend to the very limits of the world and its people. Suddenly, however, I hear a startling clap of thunder and it breaks through this empire of silence. It's this same outspoken sudden clap of thunder, this breaking through the silence of a new empire of repression that could be heard when this one particular writer, a man by the name of Xu Zhangrun, began to write critiques of the Xi Jinping government in 2018. In 2018, he published a long work called Our Fears and Our Hopes, which is the most systematic critique of the Xi Jinping government. We don't have time to go into it, but if you have time and interest, you can go to my website, chinaheritage.net, and all of Xu Danrun's works, this long essay, which has been referred to widely in publications like The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and so on and so forth, um, is translated in full with annotations. And you'll see why it's such a powerful work. It attacks Xi Jinping for becoming a new autocrat. It critiques the Chinese government for reneging on the promise of economic reform. It critiques the government for abandoning collective leadership and for trying to develop a new kind of Chinese global empire. It's daring, outspoken. I don't necessarily agree with all of it, but it's a powerful um, voice that breaks through the silence of um, fear and complicity that has become, sadly, an element of life in China today. It's a work that also... The, the author, in his work, frequently also refers back to the Qin dynasty, in particular the Qin era, pre-Qin era, when this line was first written. Well, it actually was first written in the Han dynasty about the Qin period, when, um, and it has been used again and again over the last 2,000 years to discuss the daring of one individual, the person of conscience, to speak out against autocratic behavior or a repressive environment. It reads simply... Which literally means the refusal of one decent person can outweigh the acquiescence of the multitude. Xu Ranrun was celebrated and popular as a professor of law at Tsinghua University. He's a very well known public intellectual, a highly respected um, professor of law, teacher, um, publisher, and writer. It was just that. In 2018, he was so among the group that was so outraged at the um, granting of Xi Jinping's tenure, permanent tenure as chairman of the party, and outraged at the policies that China was now initiating as it's becoming a global force and a major economic power that led him to rebel and to write these critiques of the Chinese government. Um, I won't, go into the, I, said, I won't go into the details of his critique. He critiqued the anti-corruption campaign. He critiqued Xi Jinping's return to the politics of struggle and violence, the politics of anti-intellectual behavior, a politics that threatened to undermine China's innovations and creativity, a politics that exacerbated regional problems in China, um, and so on and so forth. In later writings, he touches on such questions as Hong Kong and other matters. We'll talk about Hong Kong in a moment. Why I was personally direct, uh, enthralled by Xu Ren's work was not because of all of those things, it was because in his article he touched on one particular issue that led me back to the first time I had dealings with China when I was a 20-year-old. In his article, he criticized the special provisioning system of the Chinese Communist Party. It's called Te Gong Zhi. Now, this is a highly secretive yet crucial element of how the Communist Party rules, not only rules China, but maintains preeminence in that country and with its bureaucracy. The Turgungju was established in the 19, well, basically in the 1930s, and it has continued now for nearly 90 years. It means literally the special provisioning system. It's a system whereby the Communist Party, which has control over and access to the major resources of the Chinese economy through its occupation of China in the 1950s, it allocates unique resources, housing, 
cars, access to school, access to foodstuffs, access to luxury goods, access to imported goods, access to good water, access to clean air, access to travel, access to privileges, access to global travel and participation in delegations. And so it's all part of a very complex, finely honed and tuned Tergongzhi, specialist provisioning system that is divided up according to the rank you are within the Communist Party nomenclatura. There's 24, maybe 28 categories of cadres in the Communist Party, depending on your status in the central ranking or provincial or urban or rural ranking, you will have different access to different things. From, as I said, covering everything, every aspect of daily life. So despite all the economic reforms and the freeing up of the Chinese economy and the growth of, growth of a basic and massive middle class, there's this other parallel system that has existed throughout the history of the Communist Party. Now, I first encountered it as a young student in China, 20 year old, when we were in our study of Chinese literature and Communist Party history, we studied the Yan'an period of the 1940s and the Chairman Mao's policies on culture, literature, and politics, in which he directly commented on a number of works he found to be dissenting and dangerous. And one of those works was written by a young um, independent thinker by the name of Wang Shuwei, who had gone to Yan'an as a young idealist, a bit of a Trotskyite, hoping for socialist reform, a real lefty participating in the revolution. In 1942, he wrote an essay called Wild Lilies in which he said, all of my, I'm, I'm reducing a much longer argument, all of my hopes and ideals are being crushed because what I see in Yan'an is in fact a kind of new party bureaucracy that reflects the bureaucracy of traditional China. And here, though we're all supposed to be exactly the same, taking part in the war effort, working for China's betterment and future, this is this grand vision that Huang Yanpei had seen when he visited Yan'an, I see a system where, he summed it up simply, he said, where everyone is allocated one of three different colors of clothing, depending on your rank within the party. And you're allowed one of five different rankings of food, depending on who you are and what you are in ranking in the party. It's called yi fen san se, shi fen wu dong. This is how it's summed up. He said, this presages a sad future for our party because it will be a party of privilege and a replication of all the things we're supposed to be rebelling against. Wang Shui, for his efforts, now we don't have time to go into the details, he was beheaded and died in 1947. Xu Ranrun, in his long screed against Xi Jinping, named the special provisioning system as being one of the greatest threats to the People's Republic of China, to economic reform, and to the future of the creation of a level playing field for producers, consumers, and the people of China. Now, as I said, it's a heavily guarded, closely guarded secret. The details of the Togunju have been carefully maintained, secretly maintained for many, many years. But it's that element of his article that particularly led me to think, oh, I should translate this because it's very interesting. It's actually touched on something I've been concerned with for many, many years. I don't have the time to go into all the other reasons that that particular passage in his article inspired me to translate his work and I've become his really official translator. But it also touches on, if we have time in discussion, I can tell you how it touches on the rise of Zhang Krenchao and the Gang of Four, how it feeds into the Cultural Revolution ethos, how it feeds into Deng Xiaoping's career, feeds into the fall of Zhao Ziyang, how it relates to Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. They're all linked. And as I said, we don't have time to go into them, but it's for those reasons that I began translating Xu Ranrun. Now, Xu Ranrun, a well-read, engaged, um, modern, contemporary Chinese intellectual engaged with the society, a thoughtful law professor, not all that different from thousands of other engaged Chinese thinkers and people who are educators and concerned about the fate of their nation, who've been excited by the economic reforms and the gradual transformation of the Chinese political system and its legal system over the last years, in particular in the 1990s and 2000s, hoping that there'd be a gradual amelioration of the society and not necessarily an opening up, but an evolution of something that was both uniquely Chinese, that was stable, and yet offered greater hope for transformation, innovation, and a more civil and long-term stable society for the nation as a whole. He's part of this large group, and there's many people in every part of the Chinese bureaucracy, among students, among 
workers, farmers, and so on and so forth, who share these hopes. This is not, nothing extraordinary. What's extraordinary is that he was so outraged by what was happening in 2018 that he spoke out at length, in great detail, and with extraordinary power and eloquence. And that's what's led me to really being involved with his work. I've been involved with um, dissenting I, men and women of conscience writing about issues of con public concern in China since 1983. So it's, I have a bit of a history myself um, as a, somebody who's interested in these issues. One of the things he raised in particular, he said, I'm at Tsinghua University. This is a university that's famous for a number of scholars. Scholars who have, over the years, that's one way, sorry, who have who famously have advocated this and this the central um, five, ten words, which is, reads just Du Li Zhe Jing Shun Zi Yu Zhe Si Xiao, people who advocate an independent spirit and a mind that is free or unfettered. Now, this is one of the great slogans of Tsinghua University. If you're familiar with the recent kerfuffle in Shanghai at Fudan University, where the university's basic ethos and motto was changed, the words that the local um, president of Fudan University a few weeks ago cut out of the university prospectus were those words. Free mind and free spirit. That's what he cut out and that's what led to student outrage. Um, but Tsinghua University is the place that is famous for this saying and that's because it also features at a stele, at a large uh, stone monument set up in 1929 to celebrate one of China's most famous, at the time, famous intellectuals. And here's Professor Xu Ganrun from the back looking at this stele, which is at Tsinghua University and remains sort of a symbolic center of Chinese independent academic thought and um, unfettered free inquiry. Um, so that's what led me to Xu Ganrun. And his, his work came out. He's been criticized. He's been banned from publishing in March last year. He was put under formal investigation by his university. Um, secret police follow him wherever he goes. Um, he was deprived of 80% of his monthly income since then. He's not allowed to teach, take on any new students, and he's been banned from publishing. Now, all of those things apply except for the publishing. He's continued to publish illegally in Hong Kong nonstop ever since. And a few months ago, he wrote a piece, and he just titled it simply... This, Lao Zhe Bu Fu, Lao Zhe Bu Pa, which means that I will not submit, I will not be cowed. Why his spirit of independence and this unfettered intellectual pursuit is of significance, not only for China, but also for Hong Kong, is something I'd now like to turn to. It's because in Hong Kong, there's a, my, well, I should go back a step. My first job, oh, sorry, this is the picture that goes with this. This is him when he published that line about not being cowed and not giving in. He published this image as well on his WeChat, which hasn't been cut off, as he's continued to publish. I first lived in Hong Kong in 1977. I went there first in 1974. And when I lived in Hong Kong, I became the translator. I worked for a Chinese language magazine, and I was the translator at that time for one of Hong Kong's most well-known social and political commentators, a man by the name of Li Yi, or Lai Yi. And he was my boss, he was my first employer. I was 23, 22 or 23, and he employed me and another friend, Bennett Li, a Canadian overseas Chinese, to translate his work and common commentary on the Deng Xiaoping era, 17, 1977, 78, this extraordinary moment of historical transformation. And I became Li Yi's translator. Now, Li Yi is a man who's maintained and been a major, major commentator and critic of Hong Kong politics and governance since the 1970s. He's now 83 years old. He still writes a daily com column for the Hong Kong press. And I, now 65, have ended up translating Li Yi again, 40 years after I started doing it over 40 years since I started doing all those years ago. One of the things that links the Xu Ranrun debate and critique of Xi Jinping and his governance with Hong Kong quite directly is itself Li Yi. So this is one of Li Yi's own collections. The title of the collection is exactly that same title as Free Spirit and Unfettered Mind that Xu Ranrun champions, that is at the heart of the Tsinghua University 
um, culture. And it's also something that Li has talked about. To quote Li, I said, a famous Hong Kong commentator, he said, an independent spirit. When I write about that as a Hong Kong writer, what do I mean? It's about being possessed of a mind that is neither dependent nor submissive. In the Chinese case, because of the dominant system, their system in Beijing, the social environment and the long-term political ideology that the People's Republic has maintained, added that to that, we have two millennia of autocracy, most people's minds simply cannot break free of the tradition. As Lu Xun, the same writer who this, title, this talk is titled by, as Lu Xun observed in 1925, the Chinese have only ever had two modes of being. One is periods where we longed, where we longed in vain to be slaves. And then there's other periods when we have succeeded in becoming slaves for a time. As you probably know, Lu Xun is a very great critic of Chinese culture. And this is Li in one of his collections. Um, now, Li, because he's become a major, he's been a major commentator on Hong Kong, he's also been a person who's been involved with the Hong Kong debate, its engagement with Beijing, the fears and turbulence regarding the joint agreement of the 1980s and events that have unfolded since 1997. He's been a commentator on these issues, an advocate and also an activist trying to have Hong Kong people's voices heard in the councils of England and in China and in Hong Kong for over 40 years, since 1979 in fact. Since March 79 when, the first, when Deng Xiaoping first indicated to the governor of Hong Kong that China would want to negotiate to take over Hong Kong again. Now, Li, as I said, discusses the things like independence, spirit, and, and freedom of thought. He has, through the movement of the last um, nine months in Hong Kong, been a constant voice of reason and conscience regarding Hong Kong, its fate, its possibilities, and also its unfolding, what one could call, sadly, its heroic tragedy. It's something that Li first spoke about and wrote about in the 1980s. I was his translator at the time when he warned, along with many other Hong Kong thinkers and activists, who warned that eventually the agreement with the communists in Beijing would fall apart and Hong Kong may well rebel. He never thought it would rebel as it has rebelled. He never thought that the young people of Hong Kong would act as they have acted. He's incredibly impressed and moved by it. But he's been a person who's been concerned about these problems and how they would unfold for good nearly 40 years now. So his commentary and his concerns are not some sudden discovery. Um, his activism and his clarion voice of conscience has been one that has been heard in Hong Kong for all of these decades. And he's no simple, no simple figure. We can discuss more details of, of his ideas. He's one of many, many Hong Kong men and women of conscience who have cautioned, advised, participated in demonstrations, spoken out, been concerned for decades. And now they find themselves in this extraordinary moment um, that we can discuss and its meaning. It's also a world, um, it, it's, it's this extraordinary world that, I mean, this is one of the word clusters that shows this is the clamorous, complex world of the Hong Kong, what I call the Hong Kong rebellion or the Hong Kong apostasy that has been unfolding for the last um, seven or eight months and will continue to unfold for some time into the future. <clears throat> As you all know, the year 2019 was a year of anniversaries and great drama. I won't go into all the anniversaries, the anniversary of 1919, of 29, of 39, of 49, 59, Great Leap Forward, the Tibetan Rebellion, 69, the formal end of the Cultural Revolution, you probably don't know it was, the Communist Party declared the Cultural Revolution formally ended, in 1969, it, it held its Ninth Party Congress on April Fool's Day, 1969, which was, that's exactly how many Red Guards saw it, that's a great joke. Um, 79, the great transformation of China beginning then, the debate, uh, the um, negotiation of Hong Kong beginning in 79. 89, the clamorous and extraordinary student rebellion, led rebellion in Beijing and its crushing. 1999, the crushing of the Falun Gong, um, protests. 2009, an extraordinary and important moment in Chinese history because of the global financial crisis and the awareness of the Chinese authorities that they now had an extraordinary opportunity 
to not only continue their reforms, but also to play a greater role globally. So all of these years are commemorated last year. But also, it's an incredible year because of what has been happening in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong story that has unfolded. And so it's a, a world that's unfolded. And I've done a series of pieces on this, translating work of younger people, young rebels, young radicals, um, young poets, uh, women activists, feminists, people like Li, others like To Kit or Ni Kuang, who's well-known commentators. It's a world that's also summed up beautifully in the unique Cantonese environment, that extraordinary world of creativity, of, of culinary uniqueness, of kung fu movies and literature, of that strange melange of real Chineseness as well as a globalized, uh, semi-anglicized um, world. One that I sum up, and I'll just sum up in this talk by just showing you this one little image of the protests. This is one of the types of protest posters that one was handed around very widely. It's only accessible if you know both Chinese and Cantonese and English. And it reads, and if you want to read it, it reads, and this is Cantonese romanization, it reads Hong Kongers. It's a, a protest announcement. Be sure to go to Victoria Park tomorrow. It was about referring to Sunday the 18th of August. Don't only wear black and bring an extra piece of clothing, as well as a laser pointer to annoy the police. Beware of infiltrators. Guai, it's ghosts. In, it's a word for infiltrator. If you come across somebody who seems suspicious, write the following words on a piece of paper and make them read it out loud. And the words on a piece of paper in Cantonese are, do you know what the fuck I'm saying? <laughs> and unless you know both Romanization and Anglicized Cantonese and Cantonese, you wouldn't be able to understand what that is. So this is a trick to try and smoke out infiltrators from the mainland or people who are trying to you know, influence your movement and act in violent ways and try to suborn the movement. So it's one of just these wonderful moments of the, the Cantonese creativity. Another is this extraordinary person. This is a delightful young writer, well-known poet, a high school teacher, Kitty Hung. And this is, here she is with freedom. Well, the word H-I is um, a common Cantonese swear word that indicates female genitalia. I won't go any further. And as during the demonstrations, there's a very famous video clip that was posted in Hong Kong and seen by everybody, in which a policeman was battling with a young woman. They, he was beating her up, and she said, we're here to demonstrate for freedom. Well, I'll show you what you freedom, blah, 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 four-letter word, beginning with C, ending with T. And <laughs> the word in Chinese for freedom is zio, or jiu in Cantonese, and so... Immediately that same day, somebody created a new Chinese character, which says ziyo, turning it into, combining it with the word for genitalia to create freedom, that. And so she's posted this on her side just to say, I'm one of them. I am one of those women in favor of freedom. And just to give you a little taste of this sort of rambunctious, humorous, complex world that is Hong Kong. Um, Anyway, as I said, the whole Hong Kong dilemma, which is known, uh, began in 1979 with the discussion between Deng Xiaoping and Mackelhouse. Um, Li talks about it when he writes about this Hong Kong, not only the Hong Kong dilemma, he talks about Hong Kong being a place where from 1949, and he uses the expression, Bi Qin Shi Luan, a place where people came to flee the Qin the Qin Dynasty of the People's Republic of China. So that's their meeting. And I'll very quickly end because I'm going on far too long. And that's the word to, to flee the Qin, a term used in Hong Kong for many, many years just to mean to escape from the mainland. As you know, a large proportion of Hong Kong people are either escapees from the mainland in the 1950s, 60s and 70s or the descendants of people who fled the disorder of the mainland. Now, I don't have time to go into the origin. This term actually originates in the 3rd century AD, and it originates with a very famous essay about escaping disorder to find utopia and possibility. It's known as the, um, the 
record of the peach blossom spring written by Tao Yuan Ming in the fourth century AD, widely known, everybody in the Chinese world knows this essay and knows this vision of utopia. So this has been referred to repeatedly during the Hong Kong demonstrations by people. Um, and I'll just end with a few um, very quick images and we'll end with Xi Jinping, of course. And that is just to go back to the Chinese, during the student demonstrations, the police commissioner frequently made statements that were uh, at odds with reality and students often, the protesters often referred to this using a Qin dynasty expression. That this guy pointing at a, um, pointing at a deer and pretending it's a horse. Now, we, we have, don't have time to go into that, but these types of, again, expressions dating from 2,200 years ago have appeared again and again during these demonstrations. As has this figure, Sun Yat-sen dressed out ready for protest. And this has been another one of the, the chief slogans of the protest, which is merely, if we don't speak today, tomorrow we will be silenced. And Jin Sheng, to silence somebody, is the same term that Xu Zhenrun repeatedly uses regarding attempts by the Chinese authorities to silence him. Now, I'll just end, I could go on and on and on, as you can well imagine. I will end with Xi Jinping's October the 1st philosophical disquisition on history, because he, he discusses in it a poem about the Qin dynasty that Xu Ranrun also quotes at length. So both the ruler, Xi Jinping, and his main opponent have both used the same poem. This poem dates from the, the Tang dynasty. It's extremely well known. It's known as the, um, the Rhapsody of the Great Palace of Qin, or E Pan Gong Fu. Again, most, I'd say, literate, Ch many Chinese people know this very famous poem written by Du Mu in the year 825 of the Christian of the Common Era. And the poem ends, and Xi Jinping quotes this poem, saying that we must not repeat the errors of the Qin dynasty. We must make sure we rule with absolute strength, not give in to decadence or corruption, and continue to maintain our control. And the poem ends, the poem contains the following lines that are quoted both by Xi Jinping and Xu Zhenrun. And I shall I'll put up just four of the words, but the whole passage reads, the rulers of the Qin, this is from Du Mu in the 7th, 9th century AD, the rulers of the Qin dynasty did not have a moment to lament their fate. As it fell so quickly, it fell without any warning. It was overthrown by Xiang Yu, the, the great general. They had no time to lament their fate. But those came after it, the Qin dynasty, they lamented it. When those themselves lamented, they failed to learn the lessons of the Qin. Then they too merely provided fresh cause for lamentation for the future from those who would come after them. And Xi Jinping says, we must not fail to learn the lessons of the Qin and learn to maintain our power. Thank you.